This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today we have a very important show for people who are entrepreneurs or small business people. You know, how do you prepare for what's hitting us right now? We just had uh, George Gammon on earlier and was talking about the um, inversion of the yield curves and what that means. But also, for many people, in a bad economy is sometimes the best time to start. So it's, it's almost counterintuitive. So today our special guest is Vic Keller. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of KLV Capital and Experience Ventures. He's a serial entrepreneur, can't help himself. And um, <laughs> he's gonna be, he's also founded a private equity company that goes out and acquires other small businesses, takes them bigger. So he's gonna be talking about how you prepare for this crash we're in, but also what does private equity look for in a startup or a small business? But more importantly, how do you survive what we're going into right now? And you know, I hate to be a pessimist, but being a pessimist is good if you're a pessimist at the right time. <laughs> you know, you don't wanna be an optimist when you should be a pessimist. So I've made more money in bad, bad times than good times, because that's when you get started. So Vic Keller, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Grateful to be here with you. Oh, thank you. And you're in Texas. I am. I'm in Dallas, Texas. Oh, great. One, of the, one of the greatest, greatest places in the world to do business. Yeah, I'll be out there two days from now. So anyway, uh, Vic, you're, um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you become a serial entrepreneur and as a private equity guy also to acquire small businesses. How did you get started in this business? Yeah, so um, out of school, I went to work for J.P. Morgan and uh, decided I was on the wrong side of the table. Had a great, had a great, great career being a banker for three years, but I really knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and been studying business uh, probably since I was 14 years old and and just doing anything I could. So uh, at the uh, young age of 24, 25, with no capital, no resources, and just a lot of blind faith, I uh, decided I was going to be an entrepreneur and went online and formed an LLC and went and got a website and uh, and uh, built my first company. And it, it worked out well. I hired a couple of good people to work along my side, uh, paid them very little because I didn't have much and uh, really learned an industry and a space and went on to start nine more companies um, and then a total of 10. And very fortunately to have those acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. And um, that was just a ton of fun. Congrats. Oh, thank for, you. For those who may not know who Berkshire Hathaway is, Warren Buffett. And he is one of the the best private equity guys or you know, private bank guy. Anyway, um, what was your first business? That's my question. My first business was recognizing a uh, kind of global opportunity that people wanted to keep their tires properly inflated on their automobiles uh, to keep vehicles safe. It was long before uh, the national uh, safety boards across the the, the world really uh, mandated that tire pressure sensors needed to happen. And I found an extraordinary uh, uh, engineer in Taipei, Taiwan, and uh, and I, I took this product to market, and it acted as uh, what ultimately ended up being really my venture capital funding by selling my own product that allowed me to start a lot of other businesses. But right. I launched that business in 2002. It was called Tire Exam. Wow. And what did it do in the tire? Was so it you, the- you screwed it on the valve stem of, uh, of each of the tires. And if it was green, your tires were properly inflated. And uh, as you lost inflation, it turned to yellow and then red. But it was a really important thing for uh, the world to keep their tires properly inflated. And we sold these products all over the world and and uh, did quite well with them. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So the questions I have, you know, like me, like I said, it's, it's right to be a pessimist at the right time. Yeah, and a lot of times the best time to be an optimist is when everybody's pessimistic. Does that make does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. The best defense is really good offense, and yeah. and during a challenging economy like we're in, and I think about to get more in, uh, it's an extraordinary time to make some big moves. But you got to make the right moves. It's a game of chess. So let's say somebody is an entrepreneur right now, and you know, like I was, you know, I live in a pretty affluent area. Yeah. And I go through, go cruising through the Biltmore Shopping Center and shops are closing left and right. And their customers are the right customers. They have money, but they're not spending for some reason. 
and my friend's men's store closed and all this, and he had great, great product, great staff. He knew his stuff. Uh, it was good for me because everything went seventy percent on sale. So I bought my, I bought everything I could. From him. <laughs> I like your jacket. I, well, the, yeah, this came from the store across the street from him, <laughs> or the across the aisle from him. But you know, the best time to go shopping was everything's on sale. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not good for the retailer. No. Right. Do you know no. what I mean? But if you're the optimist, you're going there. Oh, everything's bad. This is good because I'm gonna. Anyways, my friend, he had the best Italian clothes, best Italian suits, 70% off, man. My teeth went soft. You know, wow. I, I racked up my credit card going, you know, because you know what hap what happens after this, the next product, because there was too much inventory. You know, after COVID, they just printed, I mean, not printed, they built too much inventory. And then the economy got worse and they couldn't sell it. But for the, for the customer, it was great. So as being yeah. a pe being a pessimist and optimist at the same time. So, but if you're a small business person and you're feeling it right now, you know something is wrong. And what's interesting too, people can't find staff. It's the biggest challenge. I mean, the biggest yeah. challenge. Supply supply chain is uh, is is something everyone's been talking about. But high quality, high capacity capable talent is uh, what I find in, in all of my businesses to be the number one opportunity yes, and the, the number one problem. It's, it's a big problem. And uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's only going to get worse. It doesn't seem that we have a society that is as motivated to work as we have seen quite candidly globally in the past. Right. So, you know, I went to military school and I'm, I'm trained to be a merchant seaman. I drove tankers for standard oil. And when a storm was coming up, it's called batten down the hatches. You know, yeah. get ready for the ride that's coming. So what does a small entrepreneur do today to batten down the hatches and get ready for the ride? Well, it's all about efficiency. I mean, I think you have to figure out how you can protect margins. There's a story you just told about uh, the clother and, and, and the challenges that they had. They ultimately had to give up margin uh, in order to move their products. So I think the the greatest thing you can do in a time like this is make sure you have the right people on your team, but make sure that you are absolutely over delivering. Um, and if you're building a business, engineer a business that you're going to outperform when it comes to the value proposition you bring to the marketplace uh, greater than anyone else. Robert, as you said, um, you know, now is going to be a tough time, but it's also going to be an opportunistic time. And uh, you hear the wealthy people talk a lot about you know, I want to keep my powder dry for when the market goes yeah. south. Um, and that's because they understand that business operators and consumers are not going to act uh, uh, sanely in a lot of cases. So, you know, I would say first and foremost, uh, just delivering an efficiently operating business. Uh, you want to have the best people, but you want to have a lean team. Um, you want to have the best products and you want to do your very best to protect well, your uh, margin. So let, let me explain. This guy is at the best shopping center. Yeah. He had the best customers cruising through there. He had the best yeah. products and he still went down. He had four stores. He's now back to one. Hmm. So, do you know what I mean? And the guy yeah. was good. His staff was knowledgeable, fantastic, great location. Everything you think is like this is the from Ralph Lauren and they were right next door to each other. So you got yeah. that. So I kept looking at it going, it just doesn't make any sense. So I, I think the customer dried up on him. And that's the only way I can look at it. Well, so, I think the customer dried up on him. And I think you'd be the the first to, you know, agree that, that the economy, the global economy yes. um, has changed greatly in the past 24 months. I mean, it's, it's been an insane cycle and people haven't known what to do. Do you buy a lot of inventory because you feel like there's a lot of pent up demand that hasn't been served? Or do you, you know, drive efficiency? Uh, do you operate leanly? It's hard to predict what a retail customer is going to do. And one of my favorite men's clothing stores is in, is in Scottsdale there. It's called the clothery. And, yes, uh, and that, I, if this store is right next to the clothery. Yeah. And I, I, I bought it. Yeah, and, I bought a Ralph ton Moore. of stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I bought a, I bought a ton of stuff and I can tell you I know I know some billionaires personally that shop at that store. Yeah. And uh you know, I could tell you there's a few things going on and one of them may be that they're not wearing as many suits as they had in the past. But um you know, there's a lot of dynamics. I mean, you have to have your antenna on consumer behavior right now if you're in the consumer product goods business. Um has got to be high and You've got to really know your marketplace. Okay, this is this is what I say to small business guys. When the economy starts to crunch in, people panic. 
And I said, at that point, you better step up your promotion. And yeah. you, spend, you spend on promotion. And the guys that stopped spending on promotion went out of business. But we can't afford to. I said, you, all, you also cannot not afford to. But they don't promote. So Rich Dad, I mean, we stepped up promotion huge. And our sales are through the roof. I was on Neil Cavuto four times in the last four weeks. You know, we're stepping promotion up heavy, 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 heavy. Every time on Neil Cavuto, our sales go through the roof. Yeah. But when I told when I told this one clothing, he had the he had the best product for men I've ever seen, but he wouldn't spend on promotion. So I went silly, you know. Yeah, I've seen that in a lot of businesses. I can tell you some of the product, but I'm in an outdoor sporting good industry and in one of the companies I own. And uh, we're promoting now and marketing now more than we've ever before. Amen. Uh, Everybody listen to that. And we're, we're, we're spending the money. We're doing it smart. We're leveraging yeah. technology. We're using digital mediums, di- digital platforms. And, uh, you know, I tell you, AI has been been building up for a long time, but it is becoming more practical and usable. And, you know, I couldn't think of a better time for that level of efficiency from a technological perspective to be introduced into our marketplace. So um, we are ferociously marketing right now, and we are becoming even more of a marketing and sales organization than we've ever had before. We need the customer to see us first and last. Right. You need to make the, you know, the, off, the offer out there, what's, what's available. And yeah, I know the people yeah. that are cutting back because the customer is cutting back. That's suicide at that one. It cuts your throat at that point, you know? So you know, uh, I think there's been a level of arrogance. I, I don't understand it, but I've seen a lot of companies that they've, they've had some level of entitlement that's happened uh, through the whole coronavirus and, and, and through this whole process that they think the customers are, they're going to stack them high and watch customers buy. And that's just not how the economy is today. Um, you got to show value and you got to get in front of your customer. And, and that's the most important thing you could do. Yeah, you know, the, the sad thing was this guy was in the middle of all these men's stores. Like I got this jacket from Polo, clotheries right not next door to them. So he was surrounded by men's stores, but he, st- he stopped promoting. It's interesting, yeah. you know. And he had some of the, I mean, made my teeth soft looking at some of the fine Italian clothes he had, 70% off. I mean, I would have advertised that. But they, you know, they, the, the auto industry, the auto industry is a good model of follow when it comes to marketing and promotion. I mean, they they have a supply and demand issue. There's much more demand than there is supply. But even during that, they've continued to advertise and market and they do not stop because they do yeah. not want to get their brand away from your mind. And so um, marketing and sales are a brilliant thing. And it's a it's a global discipline, right? No matter if you're doing business uh, no matter where you're doing business, it's a global discipline. You just got to be committed to it and you can't give up on it, but you have to spend your dollars wisely. And yeah. that's, uh, that's most important. And what, uh, what uh, Vic is selling, most small business people cut back. They stop spending when they should be spending on marketing and advertising because sales equals income. But they, they get scared. What, yeah, they get scared. scared. So let's, let's, let's leave that as tip number one. And if, if you're not an entrepreneur, just know that bad times are the best times sometimes to start a business. I've only started in bad times because everything else is kind of shut down and lots of opportunity when things are slow. But what happens is like many small business people, they cut back on the spending on marketing and advertising or they, they market and advertise to the wrong customer, or they don't even know who their customer is. I mean, it's basically, who is your customer, right, Vic? Yeah, Robert, you hit on a great point. Um, customer retention is is, uh, is the most, you know, I mean, it, it is so important right now. Uh, not know, I mean, knowing your customer is the price of admission, right? Yes. If you're in business, knowing your customer, knowing what your customer likes, loves, what they care about, where they see value, that's a price of admission and being business. But in our current times, you cannot be too relentless about retaining your customer. And, and, custo- and then that's the game we're in right now is if you can retain your customer and you can show them the maximum amount of value, you're not just going to have them right now, but as this market turns and it gets healthier, they are going to be in line to optimize their spending with you. Whether you're in a B2B B industry or a B2C industry, it's all the same, and you've got to have a relentless focus on your customer. Amen, amen, amen. So when we come back, Vic, we're going to more, what would you say to a startup right now? You know, let's, let's say 
you know, I can't believe this unemployment is as low as it can. Thousands of people being laid off by Amazon, Apple, um, Microsoft, and people, I can't find an employee. I mean, I, I, I know that's legitimate. They can't find employees. So I want to find out what you think. But if you're going to be a startup, I can't think of a better time to start. So we come back. We're with Vic Keller. He's the CEO and founder of KLV Capital and Experience Ventures. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Day Radio Show. Good news and bad news about money, the economy, about startups, about staying in business, survival. You know, we're, our guest today is is, on, is Vic Keller, CEO and founder of KLV Capital Experience. He also runs a private equity firm. So he's always on the hunt for small businesses that have a chance to grow. And so he's a very important resource. So Vic, when we were just talking during the break about how you still, it starts with number one, who is your customer? And you'd be surprised yeah. how many times I ask people that question and they don't really know where they come from, what they come for, you know, they just have, they're happy. But they don't ask them, who are you, where you come from? And as, as simple as that. But anyway, um, as a private equity guy, and you see a small business, what makes you teeth water? You go, well, this, is, this business has potential no matter what's gonna happen. Or another way of saying it, what's, what mistakes does a small entrepreneur make that you're not interested in letting them, you know, working with them? Well, no matter what business they're in, number one is the people. And so the, the, the founder, um, it could be the CEO, it could be the leader, but his leadership team, her leadership team, no matter what type of business it is, um, number one, we're looking at management. And, uh, you know, Amen. I've been, studi- wait, I've been wait, studying- wait, Vic. The rule of thumb is money follows management. Yeah, it, it totally. And you've, you've, you teach that often. And I can tell you, I've been studying business since I was a young man. And, um, you know, rather it be the most sophisticated, uh, successful investors in the world like Warren Buffett, or it be, um, you know, someone that has a small business, it always comes back to the people. And uh, I had a, a business partner. Uh, it wasn't Mr. Buffett, but a business partner that was a multi, multi-billionaire. And all he ever said is, Vic, don't ever forget the three most important things you're ever going to have in business. And it's people, people, people. And so I would say, you know, whether you're in startup mode, whether you're dealing with this economy right now, there is nothing more important than making sure you have the very, very best people um, in the marketplace. And, and as you mentioned before, we when on break, uh, there's a lot of big companies right now, uh, specifically technology companies that are releasing um, just hundreds of thousands of extraordinarily experienced, capable, young, energetic, passionate uh, people into the workforce. And um, I can tell you, I hope they they all find my name and phone number and email address because um, I have never, never in my life um, had a greater need and greater opportunities for extraordinary people. So if you're building a business today, just rule number one, job number one, is is surround yourself with people that are tenacious, um, that are ferocious learners, that understand what's going on in the economy. That That is what's gonna build your business. You may have invented the, the greatest thing um, ever known, but there's nothing that's gonna allow your business to scale and survive greater than having extraordinary talent around you. And uh, it's hard to get that right all the time, right? I mean, it's a right. it's a tough, tough, it's the hardest job in business as people, but it's well, also the biggest opportunity. I can hear people say, well, I don't have the money to hire them. Well, that's called, called a partner. Do you exactly. Know I mean? You want to find the right partner. I've, I've always acknowledged my wife, Kim, and without her, I'd never make it. But we're in the same boat paddling just as hard, you know, two oars are better than one. And uh, Always. it starts with the partner. If you're small and no capital, we started with nothing and we just kept building it day by day by day. And, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but many times I'll meet an entrepreneur and let's say it's a male entrepreneur and, and his wife is not into the business. They suffer. I've noticed that I'm going that you suffer because your wife would rather, you know, whatever the thing is, she sits at home and they fight about this. I'm going, whew. But you know, I mean, that's where it starts, in my opinion. If your husband or wife is not on the same boat with you, man, it's a Robert, tough I've, been, I've been I've been married for twenty seven years, and I've been an entrepreneur for twenty five of those. And my wife and I talk about my business literally every night at dinner, yeah. right? I mean, we she and she's got. And by the way, 
she's gotten pretty dang uh, opinionated and educated over the past uh, few years. And so I guess uh, I'm guilty of, of that, but she is absolutely a valuable resource. I agree. Partnership. And, and you hit on such an important point. Um, the partnership mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset. I find so many people that want to be in business and they say, oh, I'm not an entrepreneur. And, uh, and that's fine if they want to say they are, they aren't. But the reality of it is, if you have a partnership mindset, um, I had a, I had a business partner for years based right there where you are in Phoenix, Arizona, and he hired the most capable leaders across the country to run his retail organization. And every single one of them was a partner. Every one of them had a piece of equity. Every one of them felt ownership. And by the way, he didn't have to pay them more because of that. The businesses earn more and they were more successful and they got to share in the profitability of the business. So he was never giving anything up. He was getting their heart. He was getting their family. He was getting their mind. And, and that allowed everybody to win. So if you could have a partnership mindset, I can tell you, I mean, my base salary, you know, early on in my career was very, very low, but I had a someone that had a partnership mindset and it allowed me to become you know, ultimately wealthy. Uh, so it's super important. If you want to get 110% of someone, treat them as a partner, treat them as an entrepreneur, don't treat them as an employee. Yep. And, the, you know, I, was, I went to military school and I had six years U.S. Marine Corps. And the first the first words were taught in both the military academy, this is Rungnacker uh, Academy graduate. First thing we're taught is the word mission. I joined the Marine Corps, it's the word is mission. And so when I find somebody who cannot sell their mission, then you have an employee. If you know what I mean, they're, they're just there for the money. And then, so like at the Rich Dad Company, I mean, they're they're immersed, they're dunked and boiled in the mission because the mission, our mission is to elevate the financial well-being of humanity, and that's spiritual. So I don't, oh, it's not religious, but we, but it's important to have the mission side of the business sold and make sure people buy into the mission. And every time I've had problems is when I had CEOs or presidents who were just there for the money. There's a difference between money and mission. Very, very big difference. Any comments on that? Well, I think the biggest problem um, where that all starts is people don't have a clearly defined common mission. So yeah. I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's if you're not missionally focused and you're just tactically focused and you're trying to just get something done, but there's not a greater mission. Um, we do, you know, I believe in you know journey descriptions, not job descriptions. Right? What's the journey going to be? What's the journey? Yeah, of the, what are you trying to accomplish? So. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, but, but but companies miss that. They confuse a mission statement for an actual mission. And let me tell you, when you were in the military going on a mission, it sure to heck wasn't about a mission statement. It was about the mission you were going on, which has got a lot of elements to it. And most companies, they say, hey, we're going to try to come up with a mission statement. Well, throw it out the door. I mean, it's just, that's not what it's about. It's about what is the common mission. Yep, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, you know, that reminds me of that uh, George Patton move and all that. And this one guy is in the hospital bed and he's dying. And all. He, he says he, was, no, he wasn't dying. He was just, he was shot, cell shocked. And he says, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And George Patton walks up to him and says, your job is not to die for your country. Your job is to make sure the bastard dies for his country. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so true. You, you, you can't say that on television today anymore. You know, <laughs> oh, you're so mean and cruel. But it's real. And then um, the other thing is legal, ethical, moral. You know, if somebody's unethical, immoral, or illegal, they're gone. You know, and that's, that comes from our code of honor and things like this, which is also spiritual. The Marine Corps had a very tight code. You know, it starts with two words, Semper Fi. You yeah. Don't leave anybody and be, you always, you're always faithful forever. But those are all spiritual words. And when I went in, into the MBA program, I left. It was all about tactical, mental, strategy. You know, it wasn't really about the like the Marine Corps, where we're clear on our mission first. We sell the mission all the way through. But when I hired these CEOs and presidents, they ultimately had to be fired. And because if you're not mission driven, you're also then not legal, ethical, moral. It's really surprising how many people lie, cheat, and steal. Have you found yeah, that yourself? Yeah, I mean, people are desperate, and yes. uh, you know, I, 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 
I hope it's not everyone. Sometimes it feels like people operate from a state of just uh, fear and anxiety and are desperate. And, you know, I can tell you in business, I, I try to position things where we can operate from a mindset of adrenaline. Uh, right. We want to be excited. We want to be motivated. Right. We want to be right. encouraging. And, uh, you know, when people get desperate, they do really dumb things. And uh, we're seeing that more quite candidly all over the world and, yep. and, and certainly in the country I live in. Uh, we're seeing it more than we've ever seen it before. And it's just it's just sad, Robert. Well, it starts with leadership, too. You know what I mean? From oh. the top down. Yeah. And then, you know. Starts at the, home. Yeah. What Jordan Peterson says, you think tough men are mean or something. Look at, look at the damage a weak leader will do. Yeah. And in my opinion, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not political, but I've never seen a weaker leader than Biden. I've never seen a weaker leader. I couldn't I mean, agree with you more. It's sad. So yeah. anyway, you know, really when we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're talking about leadership, aren't we? A hundred percent. That's, I mean, that's the, the, the mission of uh, building anything starts with leadership and it's got to be clearly defined. You know, it's yeah. uh collaboration's great. Uh, having a great team in place is great, but I've never in my life found anyone that wanted to win that didn't want to win uh, for and with a great leader. And uh, yep. even as an entrepreneur, you know, I always think about, you know, who who am I winning for? And, uh, and fortunately, I kind of flip the roles and I let my people have that in my mind. They are, they're the leaders, right? I want to win for them. And uh, they expect me to do my part. So leadership is uh, something that um, it seems is, is going away. People are scared to lead and we need leadership right now, uh, globally more than we ever have before. And there's going to be a fantastic opportunity for, for young up and coming professionals to really focus on what, what the identity and the meaning and the definition of leadership is and live and act it out. So Vic, you know, I get into a lot of trouble because I talk to a lot of people and a lot of times women come up and they say, I, I, I can't find a man. So, well, what's happening? So, well, they're all TikTok dancers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I just, well, I, I, I just crack up, man. I'm watching these shows. These guys are like doing all this stuff. I'm going, that's not what a U.S. Marine does. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I, it's, it's I, uh, a whole, the whole world is changing so fast as when, when young men want to be TikTok dancers, I'm going, holy miracle. So the women are complaining and our leadership, in my opinion, is gone unless you're a TikTok business. But it's such a changing world, but the principles stay the same, don't they? Yeah, the, I mean, it's... Um, it's the same. Un yeah, unfortunately with technology, you can, uh, you can think you're rich and good looking when you're really, uh, you know, poor and... Um, and, and not good looking. And, uh, I mean, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's a fallacy that a lot of people fall into. And, uh, you know, I don't, I know some have done a great job monetizing it, but as you could tell, and we all know most of them, there's just, it's a, uh, it's a pretty empty promise. Yep. Yep. So in the world, in this world today, legal, ethical, moral, spiritual, not necessarily religious, but you're serving a higher calling than just the money. So, Mr. Keller, you know, thank you very much. Again, this is Vic Keller. Can can people call you if they really want? Are you open to that? or? Yeah, I, I am. I would say uh, it would be best if they sent me a direct message, and uh, and I'd be happy to communicate with them, and, and we could set up a time to talk and give them my phone number. I would just hate to, to, to miss a call and not know who I'm calling back. But uh, if they want to DM me, uh, they could go to Instagram, and it's open for everyone, and it's at Vic Keller, just V I C K E L L E R, and uh, I would I would be absolutely happy to set up time to get on the phone with uh, people that have you know serious, thoughtful things to talk about. And uh, I've I've tried to call some of the most influential, impactful, amazing people throughout my life to learn from them. And Robert, I have to tell you, most of the time they answer the phone and they take the call and have the meeting. So I've learned from that, and I want to give back in that way. Thank you. And thank you, because we met, uh, I met Vic at Prager University's donor. I mean, Prager is a, we're, we're, we're joint venturing with them into, you know, education via their medium, which is cartoons and things like this. But thank you for sorting, supporting Dennis Prager and Prager University. Well, they're doing amazing work there. I was just on the uh, on a, in a meeting the other day with David Prager, listening to some of the new stuff that he and his dad are doing and what's going on. That organization is absolutely fantastic. And uh, and talk about being missionally focused, Robert. Yep. They are they are on a mission 
to make this world a better place. And uh, I really support what they're doing. Yep. So Vic Keller, thank you very much. And anybody thank who you. has the opportunity to talk to this great person to find out, you know, if you're tired of being a TikTok dancer, call Vic Keller. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for you, having thank me. Great you, to be thank with you. you. So when we come back, we're going to have final words on uh, being an entrepreneur in troubled times. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. I want to thank Vic Keller, CEO and founder of KLV Capital Experience. And once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes and Android. And also, all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason, so you can listen to it again if you want to listen to it again. But most importantly, you have a friend or a possible business partner or a wife or a brother-in-law or children Get together and listen to this program because I, I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're heading some rough, rough, rough times financially, globally. So this is a, you know, it's the best time to get rich when it's bad. But most people want it to be good before they get rich. And the other thing, that thousands of people are being let go right now. And it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. Any words there, Sarah? What'd you pick up? No, I completely agree. If anything that we learned during the pandemic... The whole world was shut down and people had to become creative and innovative. Some of the biggest brands that we know just now were started during the pandemic. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And so I'm thinking, so I totally, absolutely agree with that message that these, these hard times create opportunities and you just have to, um, we talked a little bit about fear and, you know, getting past that. If you have that entrepreneur spirit and mindset, you not opportunities like this are, are the time for you. Right, but also, you know, he talked about using technology, and Sarah knows I'm as backward technology wise, but we have smart technology people. Right, and that right, and that's the point is rely on your team. You have a t- we have a team of people. I can't do what Rob does. Rob doesn't do what I do, but because we surround you, um, we're all better for it. And he t- he touched a little bit about the change in digital, you know, advertising. How advertisers are really traditional advertisers are really struggling right now. Right, and that's just being adaptive with the times. Where, go where your customers are. I was, I was watching YouTube, but even Fox Television has a YouTube correct uh, system, you know, channel. Yep, yep. So it's just adapt, adapt, and change. And then if you you don't know something, then find somebody who knows what you need to know. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, there's no shortage of that. You know, there's no shortage of finding people who may know know something and be able to help you out. But most importantly, be legal, <clears throat> ethical, and moral. You have no idea how much, you know, like never cheated on Kim and all that stuff. I just don't do that. But I have friends who do, and I just, I don't know how they get, you know, my conscience would bother me. But I'm not here to be the Pope to tell them what to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, before we close out this show, it's an entrepreneur show, starting businesses. You've started several businesses. What, what, are, what would be the number one thing? that you would tell an entrepreneur or startup to focus on right now? Well, it's what's your mission. You know, what does, I always, I always ask myself this. I'm not really religious. I'm not preaching. I ask myself, what does God want done? Or what problem needs to be solved? And if that problem, you know, touches your heart and your mind and your spirit, then that might be where you focus on. And there's no scarcity of problems today. There's no scarcity of problems today. So fo- focus on serving more people. That's thank fa- you. fantastic. Thank you so much. So thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show.
no. 